so much for being here. I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of the Liturgical Arts Festival of Springfield. It's so exciting to see so many people here today. It's been, we have had great attendance. We have more exciting programs, and we hope that you will be there. Uh, I would like to thank the Sacred Heart Convent for opening up the space for us today, uh, despite you know all the difficulties we've been facing, and thank you for accommodating the needs to wear the mask today. I will ask Sister Beth to go ahead and come and say a few words and then introduce our speaker as you're all waiting to hear him begin. Thank you. Thank you, Tarpa. It is a delight to see all of you here, and I want to reiterate Tarpa's thanks for your mask wearing. Um, this is not only a beautiful chapel, and a wonderful public meeting space, but this is home for 90 of our sisters, most of whom are elderly, and we have grave concerns for their health. So you need to understand that that's why we're all masked tonight. I wish it were otherwise, but it's essential uh, that we keep them safe, and I appreciate your help in doing that. So behalf on all of those 90 Dominican sisters and the rest of us around the country who are in ministry, I want to welcome you to Sacred Heart Convent officially. I also want to thank the planning committee for the Liturgical Arts Festival. It's a lot of their hard work that makes this possible, so we need to be grateful for them, too. So this is going to be a really enjoyable evening. How many of you have ever heard Anthony speak before? See, I'm telling you, it's a whole room full of Anthony Rubano movies. That's what we got here. This is, this is great. Nobody could. He probably could. Uh, I just want to um, share a few details with you to help make your evening more comfortable. Um, I want to tell you where the restrooms are, basically. Okay. So at the back of this room, this way, behind where the videographer is, where, where Brandon is, there's a door that says restrooms. And if you open that door, the first room on your right is the men's restroom. And then there's another door that's propped open. If you go through there, you'll find the women's restroom. There are also two restrooms in this hallway here, and they're marked with the arrows that are in the ceiling. But you want to leave the room through that door and not this door. This one will get you caught in the thing we call the man catcher. <laughs> that's like a security system there. So you can only get out from there. So if you want, if you need to leave the room and use the restroom, you want to go through that back door. And there's enough of us around here who can help you if you get lost or need, need something. Um, I've already expressed my concern about our elderly sisters and have asked you to wear your masks. I appreciate that very, very much. Um, at the end of the evening, when you leave, we're going to ask you to, to you can use either door to go because you're going to go right out to the parking lot. As tempting as it might be for some of you to want to go back up to the chapel, we're going to have to ask you not to do that. So um, you're finished in the chapel for this evening, uh, and you'll just exit out to the parking lot when the evening is finished. Now, for the reason that we're here. Reading Light, the Art and Architecture of Sacred Heart Convent Chapel. Uh, prevented, yes, please silence your phones. That was one of the things I forgot. <laughs> now watch, but mine is not silent, so you just watch. It's going to go off in my pocket. Um, for those of you who don't know Anthony or aren't familiar with him, he's the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer for the state of Illinois. And he has taught at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He is the real go-to guy for historic property renovations, I think all over the state, right, Anthony? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and he's locally famous for walking tours, which I just came to find out he's retired from. He's not going to do them anymore. We might have to do something to change that. I don't know. Um, Anthony brings uh, a unique perspective to this convent, to this chapel, really to our whole building that we would never have thought of before. Um, his understanding of mid-century modern architecture is broad and deep. And he is bringing to us this evening his own intellectual curiosity. And he seems to have a fascination with understanding the context of architecture. And I think he's going to help you to understand that in a deep way tonight. So you're in for a treat. 
Uh, he's going to put our beautiful chapel in its historic context and help us appreciate the creative impulses of early and mid 20th century and what that has to say to us as people of faith, whatever that faith tradition may be. So Anthony, you have our attention. try this. Oh my goodness. Everything seems to work. Well, thank you, Sister Beth. Thank you to the Liturgical Arts uh, Festival for asking me here to um, sort of uh, reprise a presentation that I had prepared for the 50th anniversary of the chapel, but I also uh, kind of rewrote it because I didn't like it. <laughs> so I had to look at it again, and I'm glad I did because it's an excuse to look at beautiful architecture, and I'll take that wherever I can get it. So I really do appreciate the opportunity to bring this information to you, and also reiterating the thanks we've heard for the, the um, uh, convent opening up the chapel for us to view. It is an extraordinary thing that uh, I hope you'll share in my appreciation of. So the chapel, oh, the lights, if those could go out, that would be great, at least above the screen, perfect. <coughs> Okay, the chapel of the Sacred Heart uh, Convent is a, a powerful, imposing structure, as I, I hope you've all experienced. It anchors the Sacred Heart Convent visually, spiritually, and artistically. Both its art and its architecture are frank expressions of aesthetics, of faith, and of their time in history. For the most part, they share a common starting point in modernist design vocabulary, which we'll discuss. The chapel's bold, cubic composition is softened only slightly by the rich texture of its buff brick and the subtle veining of its unpolished Missouri marble. The same material palette continues inside, but with more glossiness. The marble is now polished. The floors are polished terrazzo, and they contrast with the blonde brick, the golden oak trim, uh, uh, the trim in the furnishings, the stone and the glass mosaics, and of course, the luminous Dal de Vere stained glass windows, which were beautifully lit uh, this evening. When we consider the words, what am I doing? Yes, when we consider the words convent and chapel, images like these on the screen may not be the first that come to mind. But by 1965, when Sacred Hearts designs were in place, there had already been much discussion as to what religious art and architecture should look like in the 20th century. Perhaps the best known are the discussions of the Second Vatican Council, or Vatican II as it was called, which encouraged a subtle shift in emphasis from a house of God, or Domus Dei, to a house of the worshipful, Domus Ecclesiae, from the altar as focus to the relationship between the altar and the congregation as focus. But arguments of contemporary expression of sacred art and architecture raged well before Vatican II. Well before Vatican II. <laughs> Catholic scholar Edward Foley notes that even during the Council of Trent, begun in 1545, it was remarked that certain architectural changes to Catholic churches would be necessary to better compete with the design innovations initiated by the Protestants. <laughs> That sentiment did not prevail at that time. <clears throat> By the mid-19th century, Catholic clergy heavily favored art and architecture that strictly followed established academic rules, what we now call academicism. So look at the similarities of these two works of art on the screen, despite their almost 300-year age difference. In a reaction against academicism, a handful of European artists architects, and theologians in the late 19th and early 20th centuries pressed for modern or at least contemporary ecclesiastical <laughs> vocabularies. Artists like Maurice Denis and Georges Rouault, both of whom were quite devout, wrote about and worked in contemporary styles as they depicted religious themes, often presenting religious figures in contemporary environments as we see on the right. They rejected academicism because they saw it 
as sacrificing emotion to artifice. In 1919, Denis founded an art studio dedicated to contemporary religious art. In 1920, art student Pierre-Charles-Marie Couturier, on the right, joined that studio. In 1923, Couturier and Denis designed for the Church of Notre Dame de Rancy on the left, what is recognized to be the first installation of abstract stained glass windows. The reinforced concrete church itself is one of the most important early modern expressions of religious architecture. In 1925, Couturier left Denis's studio to enter the novitiate of the Dominican friars at Amiens and was ordained a Catholic priest in 1930 whereupon Couturier's Dominican superiors ordered him to continue to decorate churches. With Dominican support, Couturier became an outspoken advocate of modern art and architecture in church design. From 1936 to his death in 1954, he co-edited an important journal of contemporary liturgical decoration. He was involved in highly influential compositions like these that pushed the boundaries of both modernism and of ecclesiastical artistic expression. For the interior of this church, Couturier assisted in commissioning work from some of the most famous artists of the first half of the 20th century, some of whom, as you can see on this list, weren't even Catholic. Couturier argued, quote, it is safer to turn to geniuses without faith than to believers without talent, end quote. <laughs> and I think that is a spectacular quotation. This interior scheme of paintings, sculptures, tapestry, stained glass, ceramics, and mosaics is a microcosm of the era's changing conceptions of sacred art. In 1947, just as Notre Dame du Haute Grasse, which was the uh, uh, previous uh, church that I had shown, Pope Pius XII cautiously endorsed modernism, albeit within certain parameters. Quote, Modern art should be given free scope in the due and reverent service of the church and sacred rites, provided that they tend neither to extreme realism nor to excessive symbolism, end quote. So modernism is okay, but not too modern, please. <laughs> he continued with, an, with uh, an admonishment, quote, we cannot help deploring and condemning those works of art recently introduced by some, which seem to be a distortion and a perversion of true art and which at times openly shock Christian taste, modesty, and devotion. Undeterred, mm -hmm. Father Couturier mm -hmm. continued to push for new artistic expressions. The chapel on the left by Henri Matisse was dedicated to, to Couturier's own Dominican order, which continued to strongly support modern ecclesiastical aesthetics, the same order, incidentally, responsible for this convent and chapel. Both of these two churches on the screen are abstracted, yet representational. They are modern, but, in my view, they do not shock. Of course, here in 2022, looking at this, is this shocking? Well, perhaps not, but at the time, 1949, I can't assume. They are not immodest, but were, but were they pontifically acceptable? Though widely published and quite influential, these commissions, along with the inclusion of non-Catholic artists in the interior scheme of Notre Dame du Haut Grasse, led to an aesthetic crisis in the Catholic Church. In June of 1952, the Holy Office, which is responsible for promulgating Catholic, Catholic doctrine, pulled back from the progressive artistic expression in its introduction on sacred art. It noted that, quote, a certain art which calls itself modern brings its deformations and teratological figures into the tranquility of sanctuaries, end quote. Therefore, it advised clergy of the norms of sacred art, quote, so that forms, procedures, forms and procedures correspond perfectly to the decor and sanctity of the house of God, end quote. The Holy See quoted extensively from the Code of Canon Law of 1917, Again, this was written in 1952, quoting something from 1917, written, interestingly, before the existence of what we now call modernism in either art or architecture. The code forbade, quote, statues that express some false dogma or lack of proper decency and decorum, or that could influence the ignorant to fall into a dangerous error, end quote. Interestingly, 
Despite what the Holy Office might have thought of them at the time, the Vatican now proudly displays Matisse's cartoon for the stained glass and a chasuble he designed for the Chapelle de Beaux-Air in its art gallery. And I had the pleasure of seeing these when I went to Italy a couple of years, when we could travel a couple of years ago. The Holy Office's 1952 instructions do support, however inadvertently, architectural modernism, at least as I read it. Quote, a new church should shine in the simplicity of its lines, eschewing in decorous ornamentation, end quote. Such retrenchments did nothing to discourage experiments in modernist church art and architecture. They simply resulted in more discussion and more experimentation. In 1956, Sir Basil Spence, architect of one of England's most important modern churches, albeit an Anglican church, wrote that churches should reflect the time of their construction. Quote, important principles in church design have been handed down to us through our great churches and cathedrals. And while traditional requirements have changed very little for the older communions, architects should be encouraged to be inventive and to breathe a contemporary vitality into the various parts of the building. He continued, quote, the Gothic churches, the Renaissance cathedrals, and the Georgian nonconformist preaching houses were all contemporary architecture in their time, end quote. In America, one church in particular revealed how a modernist, although non-Catholic, church could be poetic, relevant, and engaging. Christ Lutheran in Minneapolis by the Finnish architect Eliel Saarinen is an exquisite tapestry of material and texture. The editors of Architectural Forum said of it in 1950, quote, art, science, and faith achieve a serene harmony in this little church. In purity and simplicity of form, it recalls the early Christian era, end quote. So to the editors, the apparent simplicity of modernism could be equated with the austerity of religious asceticism. But unadorned surfaces and an emphasis on material texture over applied ornament were also seen as a means to focus attention on the liturgy and perhaps ritual, the process of worship, if you will, rather than on religious splendor through opulence. Surely this design, quote, shines in the simplicity of its lines, end quote, as the 1952 Holy Office would shortly recommend. Architectural modernists, especially in America, equated traditional church design with a, a lowering of collective creativity. They continued to pursue more progressive architectural expressions across denominations. And I show two Catholic churches, and I love the one on the right in Little Colfax, Illinois. I encourage you to go out there and seek it out. Earlier I asked if the word chapel brought to mind images, like the chapel of the Sacred Heart Convent. It turns out that by 1962, when Sacred Heart was commissioned, there were already very advanced examples of what a modern American chapel could look like. There were also very progressive ideas of what a convent or a monastery could look like. These were not simplified versions of Gothic or Renaissance forms. They were wholly new architectural compositions. Often made, met with great acclaim, as these examples were, these designs helped shift the public's awareness of modernism and pushed the boundaries of what a convent and a church and their art might look like. The tumultuous 1950s concluded with a call for spiritual renewal. In 1958, Pope Pius XII, who in 1947 warned against modernism going too far, died. In October of 1958, Pope John XXIII was elected, and in less than four months, he called for the Second Vatican Council, which led to a liberalization and modernization of church practices. By its conclusion in 1965, the council asked that churches strive for, quote, noble beauty, end quote. So we see that despite popular conceptions of its degrees, Vatican II was not the start of ecclesiastical modernism. It was perhaps its confirmation, or from another vantage, its vindication. In 1965, it would have been hard indeed to reverse the advances in modernist religious architecture generally and in Catholic church design specifically, especially when the advances had been so undeniably successful. <clears throat> the parish church in the burgeoning suburbs was especially suited to receive advanced forms, reflecting the attitudes of its congregation and clergy, and evoking the tabula rasa of the newly realized suburban landscape. 
A prominent example of the new American suburban parish church is this, the first Presbyterian church in Stamford, Connecticut, by Wallace Harrison. Harrison used the early Christian symbol ichthys as the inspiration for the building's plan and section. And you can see the plan of it. Were they way down? Oh, blah, blah, what the hell? <laughs> it's technology at its best. What am I doing? I'm apologizing for any seizures you may have <laughs> at this point. There we go. Here we go. So, um, oh, what a relief. Okay, so here's the plan of it down there. I don't know if you could see below people's heads, but it's way or above them, depending on your perspective. So, right down there. So, ichthys fish, obviously, we're talking about. So, um, Wallace Harrison, the architect, said of this building, quote, when you've plotted through it all methodically from the beginning, the human needs, the floor plan, the economics, the structure, you must still get to an emotional reaction. The answer is to merge art and architecture. At Stanford, we did it by bringing in color and the stained glass design. As Harrison searched for an artist to provide the stained glass for his Stanford commission, he spoke with Fernand Leger whose Church of the Sacred Heart we saw a moment ago. Indeed, it was Leger's use of the dal de verre, or slab of glass technique in this commission that brought the medium to the attention of many would-be patrons. Leger suggested to Harrison that he get in touch with a French glass designer who specialized in dal de verre, Gabriel Loire. And Harrison sought out Loire and hired him to fill the walls of the Stamford Church with Dal de Vere in what became his largest American commission up to that time. Harrison described the visual impression of the completed installation as being inside a giant sapphire. And I can attest to that. I took the picture on the right. And it is a stunning, stunning place. In America, interest in Gabriel Loire's work surged, prompting Loire to develop a small network of representatives in the US, which then led to many more commissions. Loire had an active career long before Harrison hired him to design the windows at Stamford. He started making Dal de Verre in 1935 in Chartres, France. And in 1946, he opened his own studio that produced both leaded and dal glass, as well as mosaics. Father Couturier, Father Couturier who we saw a minute ago, knew him and his work. She's enjoying the presentation. <laughs> Loire quickly focused on Dal de Verre, the technique that would make him famous. Loire sketched uh, the original designs. Here on the left is his original sketch for the adoration above the altar of Sacred Heart, above us, actually. In his studio, a team of highly skilled artisans produced full-scale cartoons from Loire's original sketches. Studio craftsmen cut the glass slabs to match those in the cartoons and created the windows. Dal de Verre was not constructed like a leaded stained glass windows, window where thin pieces of glass are held in place by metal strips or canes. In Dal de Verre, slabs of glass are placed in position and then concrete or epoxy is poured around them to form a rigid panel. Because of their weight, the panels often have steel reinforcing bars and trained into the matrix, as we can see on the left, thereby making the panels self-supporting. Epoxy, in, the use by, in use by the late 1950s, gives a shiny surface between the glass units, as we see on the right. Loire worked in epoxy, but he preferred concrete, and that is the material that he used here in the Sacred Heart Chapel. The glass in doll windows is much thicker than in traditional stained glass windows. The thickness is quite noticeable, and it provides a richness in both color and texture. Leger's windows in Audencourt on the left were unfaceted glass, so these were just thick pieces that had you know, right-angled edges. And that gives a flatter, more graphic overall appearance. Loire, on the other hand, relied on faceting or chipping the edges of the glass to form chunks instead of slabs, and that achieved this all-important texture. Some pieces, like a, on the upper right, that's a close-up of one of the slabs upstairs, retain their original cast surface, cast in sand, and then hardened and lifted up, and that's the texture you see on the back. And then that surface is modulated 
by deliberately chipping the glass with a hammer, also called oystering. As you can imagine, the shapes of the chips are like an oyster shell. So those chips, that oystering acts like a facet on a gem catching the sunlight, and it also modulates the color of the window because the glass is thinner where the chip is thinner. So the coloration of the glass changes as the chips define its perimeter. Loire equated his faceting and its light modulation with traditional grisaille. And there's an example of that here. A centuries-old technique of applying monochromatic enamel to clear and colored glass to give subtle shading. He said, quote, the cutting, in other words, the chipping, created effects like those provided in leaded glass by grisaille. But he used faceting to achieve what grisaille never could, quote, to reflect, refract and diffuse the light so that it seems to come from within the glass rather than from behind, end quote. And I hope you were able to see that upstairs as the sun was setting. The glass was exquisitely lit, and that refraction of the faceting, that's exactly the effect that Loire wanted to achieve. He also saw that Dahl's textural and tonal richness captured and communicated emotion. It was, in his, his words, quote, a matter of giving glass its full value. When I have a piece of blue glass, a color that he very much favored, where the blue isn't simply the blue of the exterior, but is also the blue of the interior of the glass, it's, it, it's as if I've made it live, I've made it talk, end quote. The expressiveness of the glass itself was enhanced by how Loire treated the negative space in his design, the concrete that holds it together. The concrete in Dal de Verre functions structurally like the metal caming in traditional stained glass. The example on the left from the cathedral that some of you might have enjoyed the concert in on Friday. The um, caming physically holds the glass in place. The consistent thinness of the metal canes can flatten the apparent depth of a window design, separating colors as a pen might on paper, and suggesting shifts of planes as we see on the left. It is a flattened more graphic way of communicating the image, I think. However, the variable widths of concrete in a doll window, such as we see on the right, allows it to be used in a more painterly or calligraphic manner to become an active participant in the window design. In Loire's words, he, quote, tried to obtain an equal sumptuousness, end quote, to traditional stained glass by emphasizing the silhouetted concrete not unlike a stone tracery would in a Gothic cathedral. Loire's window fraternal life on the right is an excellent example of the discussion he creates between the positive of the glass and the negative of the concrete. Perhaps the most overt characteristic of Loire's windows in Sacred Heart Chapel is their abstraction. Loire's early doll windows, such as on the right from the 1940s, were figural. In other words, they were representation. They had figures in them. You, they were not abstract. For centuries, stained glass windows told the story of the Bible to congregants who could not read, or at least who could not read Latin. For this basilica in Chile on the right, Loire designed the windows that functioned, in his words, quote, as in the old days, a sort of Bible of the people, end quote. But he also returned to figuralism throughout his career as on the left in a late window of his. For complex narratives, uh, on the left we see a window that relied on grisaille to create the visages of both 20th century prisoners of conscience and those at the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. Loire tailored his approach to the commission. Quote, when, <clears throat> when a man speaks to the Pope, he speaks in one way, with one vocabulary. If he speaks to the butcher in the village, he speaks in another, to a soldier still in another. For me, it was the same. According to the people to whom I address myself, I spoke in one way or another. It is above all to the people that I address myself, to those who will be in the church, end quote. When designing windows for a religious community, such as here at Sacred Heart Convent, he said, quote, the figurative is no longer necessary, and the artist can move towards something more abstract, end quote. No storytelling was necessary here. Sacred Heart's windows challenged the viewer requiring interpretation and cogitation. Sister Beth just told me of a realization she had recently about the windows, and you've been staring at them for 40 years, you said. I didn't give away 40 years, I'm 
sorry if I, if I said too much. But it just sort of proves the amount that you can spend looking at that is rewarded in these more abstract experimentations that Loire undertook here. They invite many viewings and much contemplation, perfect for a chapel that sisters attend daily. The window on the right is to me the chapel's most graphically arresting and also the most challenging, perhaps the most beautiful, that's subjective. Loire left us, in, left us his interpretations of all the windows, which you can read in the guides that have been uh, distributed. For apostolic life, he wrote, quote, light emanating from interior areas and shining forth to illumine, illumine the exterior areas treated in black and white verticals, depict the spirit of the apostle. At intervals, the tongues of the fire of Pentecost recall the work of the mind, the gift of languages, and the conversion of the darkness of ignorance into the light of knowledge, end quote. Loire did include some figural elements in several of the windows. They give us a starting point from which to unravel their respective compositions. In the window, St. Joseph, Loire uses the fleur-de-lis and a carpenter's hammer to signify St. Joseph, that is, on the left. In study, in the middle, Loire places the Hebrew words for holy and peace among open books, and he lets Greek letters suggest the revelation verse, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In the window light on the right, Loire scatters candle flames across a radiant sky. I think the cleverest example of his abstract figural elements is to propel the overall composition in praise, where he winds music clefts and staffs with Gregorian square notation up the lancet towards the heavens. Loire also used colors strategically in Sacred Heart. Narthex windows, that's in the front of the church, are vivid and almost playful. But when one proceeds towards the nave, their coloration changes to a more controlled palette based on whites and grays, reflecting the traditional colors of the Dominican order. Punctuated with dots of red, blues, and oranges, the restrained, near monochromatic palette gives the windows a graphic impact that when combined with his gestural use of concrete, has amazing presence and power. The windows are but one element that give the chapel its presence, certainly an important one, but just one. Loire, as was usual, had no control over the building in which his windows would be installed. He would say that his job was to fill the holes left for him, in his words, to cork up the building with his windows. And it was no different at Sacred Heart. The original architectural drawings called for faceted glass, an understandable translation of Dal de Vere. And then they say, NIC. So what does that mean? Any guesses? Not in contract. Not in contract. Thank you, architect O'Shea. Not in contract. As harmoniously as the art and architecture work together, this was not a collaboration. And Loire would say that it was rarely a collaboration in any of his commissions. The windows and the buildings speak the same modernist language with full knowledge of the other's presence, but they were created separately. Hadley and Worthington, the firm who created the architecture of the chapel, had a long history at Sacred Heart. Siena Hall Dormitory, which is just right out there, uh, at Sacred Heart Academy was designed by the Springfield firm in 1950. It was one of at least four commissions for Sacred Heart Convent and Academy that the firm received before it was hired to design the mother house, where we are, in 1962. Earl Worthington graduated from Notre Dame in 1927 with a Bachelor's of Architecture. Bryant Hadley worked with Worthington for 10 years at the Illinois State Architect's Office. Each leaving that office in the early 1940s, they came together in 1944 to found Hadley and Worthington Architects. Worthington, a practicing Catholic, held many memberships and associations that led to several commissions from the Springfield Diocese. Envisioned as a campus, Sacred Heart Convent was designed as one cohesive complex with one aesthetic. By 1962, the year the commission arrived at the firm, Hadley was 71 and Worthington was pushing 60. That's old, Paul. <laughs> Ancient. So based on their traditional design of Siena Hall, we can assume that the design of Sacred Heart was sent to younger associates in the firm 
whose more recent education was based in contemporary strains of architectural modernism. So who were these people? Well, the title block from the original drawings can help us quite a bit. Hadley and Worthington gave each commission its own job number. The first two digits represented the year the commission arrived, and the last two was the order in the calendar year that the commission came in. So the mother house was the 17th commission the firm received in 1962. In the early 1960s, Hadley and Worthington was at its largest at 12 to 14 employees. <coughs> Ken Parker produced many of the drawings for Sacred Heart. He took correspondence courses in architecture and worked at Hadley and Worthington from 1960 to 1968. A year after he left, he received his architecture license. We see the initials of the firm principal, Earl Worthington. Typically, a partner will approve drawings that go out under the firm's name, but it doesn't mean he or she did the design, and that, I think, was the case here. Aidan Lochner received a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Illinois in 1956 and was a project architect at Hadley and Worthington from 1959 to 65. We know from oral histories that Lochner was a main designer for the complex, and this makes sense, as Lochner had a position in the firm high enough to design and check construction drawings, but not actually to draw them. There were, you know, he had people to do that. Bill Maslowski graduated from the University of Illinois in 1961 with a Master of Architecture. He received his license in 1962 and then worked for Hadley and Worthington. In 1965, Maslowski, Lochner, and another colleague left the firm to found their own firm. But by the time they left, the mother house was entirely designed and it seems entirely drawn. The complex is a tight asymmetrical arrangement of buildings on the landscape. North is to the right on this drawing. As an, uh, an asymmetrical limestone bell tower sits at the geographic heart of the city block on which the campus was placed. The complex is organized around it and its aluminum cross faces east, which is down, towards visitors as they arrive. The bell tower provides an orienting focal point for users as they circumnavigate the complex. To me, that circumnavigation is a critical part of the overall design. In a modern interpretation of cloisters, two-story windowed walkways link the buildings together and enclose the landscape into courtyards. The corridors protect the inner space from the outer space. They insulate access, but they transmit views. While they allow the sisters to perambulate without going outside, they provide orienting perspectival views of the complex. And the cloisters continue through the building masses as hallways. Living units were provided in two multi-story buildings, anchoring the north and south sides of the campus along its western edge. The building to the north, so that's the building to the right, um, was for perpetually professed sisters. To the south was for juniorates, who are now called temporary professed sisters. A donut-shaped dormitory for novitiates was planned but not constructed because it was not needed. So here we have three residential buildings representing three distinct phases of the transition to a Dominican sister. Novices were on the public eastern side of the complex, which makes sense, as novitiates are transitioning into the convent, moving westward, and then towards the chapel as they progress. The main entry, the offices, classrooms, and library are placed between the novitiates and the juniorates. Novitiates must pass through the classrooms and library to get to any other part of the complex signifying the training that accompanies their transition towards becoming juniorates. Juniorates must also complete additional training, so they have a direct link to the library and the classrooms as well. The dining room, refectory, is between the residential towers. The chapel anchors the northeast corner of the complex. It's accessible from three of the main convent buildings, acknowledging its importance in the lives of the sisters. But it's also close to the eastern parking lot for the laity who wish to worship there. The chapel is presented on a plinth, fronted by a grand staircase, and anchored by an immense planter to elevate it both literally and figuratively. The buildings were built exactly as the 1965 drawings placed them, with the exception of the novitiate dormitory that was never constructed. The buildings read as one cohesive composition, like a modernist campus. 
And the reading of the, campus as an the, camp the convent as an educational campus is reinforced by a small, easily overlooked detail. It's not a building, but a landscape element. The serpentine walls that um, defines the campus's southern edge along West Monroe. It's immediately recognizable as an element drawn from University of Virginia by Thomas Jefferson. While Aidan Lochner may have had the most in design input, we know from interviews that Bill Maslowski, who drafted Sacred Heart's plans and contributed to the design, included these in serpentine walls at the very least. When he first visited UVA, he saw these walls and was determined to put them in his first project out of school, and he succeeded. <laughs> it's not a stretch to view Sacred Heart as a literal campus. Jefferson called his University of Virginia a, quote, academical village. And what is Sacred Heart but a religious village? It did and does have a critically important educational component with classrooms and a library. And it is a community of students in a manner of speaking, supporting the transition from novitiates to temporary and then perpetually professed sisters. UVA and Sacred Heart link their pavilions with walkways to enclose the landscape and define courtyards or quadrangles as worlds unto themselves. Each complex has as a focal point a monumental building critical to the functioning of the campus, raised on a plinth, accessed by a grand stair, and linked to the rest of the community by covered walkways. Jefferson placed his dome library at the axial center of his campus. Hadley and Worthington placed the chapel at a prominent corner to mediate between public and private space. At Sacred Heart, the chapel is the dominant component as visitors approach. The architectural vocabularies of Sacred Heart and UVA are entirely different. Georgian at UVA, modernist here at Sacred Heart. But the architecturalization of collegiality is parallel in both. UVA directly influenced dozens of college campuses since, which is so often why colleges employ neo-Georgian as their design vocabulary. And although Aidan Lochner and Bill Moslowski both attended the U of I's neo-Georgian campus in Champaign, they looked to other precedents when they designed Sacred Heart. Among the most famous modernist campus plans is the one by Mies van der Rohe for the Illinois Institute of Technology, just a short ride to Chicago. It's a low campus with separate buildings arranged on a modular grid. Interestingly, IIT's heating plant, the tallest structure on the campus, bears more than a passing resemblance to a church with its longitudinal tripartite design recalling the traditional three-aisled basilica form and its smokestack marking the landscape like a campanile. Very well known to architects by the 1960s, IIT provides us the concept that strict modernism can be successfully applied to an entire campus plan. For more specific precedents for Sacred Heart, I think we must look elsewhere. The visual character of the buildings at Sacred Heart is largely derived from Aidan Lochner's design for its concrete exterior walls. You can see on the right a uh, construction photo of the campus. And those exterior walls that have slit windows paired around strongly expressed columns. The first floor is recessed behind the columns while the walls ap above appear as more floating modular panels within a structural frame. It's a composition that Lochner developed in subsequent commissions like the one on the left in downtown Springfield. Well, this kind of organization was something that was being explored in the very late 1950s within the larger context of architectural modernism. We see the very same kind of wall composition in these buildings on the East Coast. Rendered in textured masonry and stone, it established a muscular rhythm to the design and gave the building a strong presence without anything that could be seen as overtly ornamental. Sacred Heart, with its sense of scale and enclosure, suggests also to me this particular design by Eero Saarinen, among the most renowned architects of the 20th century. His pair of residential colleges in Yale, very, very well published, just as the Sacred Heart Commission arrived at Hadley and Worthington. Here we have a mix of building heights asymmetrically placed to enclose and then reveal. Saarinen used masonry walls and unbroken planes, relieved at the ends by vertical slits of windows. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Saarinen used the crescent shapes and lack of right angles to suggest medieval Italian hill towns, like San Gimignano, with its fortifications, churches, and towers. 
At Stiles and Morse, the rubble masonry walls are heavily textured, capped with a regular smooth line of stone. They rely on non-orthogonal geometry to create an interesting parapet shape against the sky. At Sacred Heart, the walls are regular and orthogonal, while the parapet itself is irregular. Columns rise above the brick walls. Marble spandrels that cap the slit windows are placed behind and lower than the brick walls. Two approaches that achieve the same end, a rich textured silhouette against the sky. Sacred Heart's designers also look to American brutalist architecture for inspiration. Architects like Paul Rudolph were experimenting with complex massing, cruciform columns with inset centers, and structural components that broke from the mass of the building to become discrete design elements, like the Campanile here. Texture was a crucial design element to brutalism. Rudolph's buildings were uh, juxtaposed smooth and rough concrete to achieve a tapestry-like texture. Sacred Heart subtly combined vein marble and mottled buff brick for a similar effect. But I also think that Sacred Heart's complex parapet and overall emphasis on verticality suggests abstracted Gothic crockets and buttresses as they meet the sky. The large beam that supports the chapel's roof are of in, uh, reinforced poured-in-place concrete, the same material as Paul Rudolph's Art and Architecture building. So here we are talking about, where is this? Oh, it's because it's shooting at me. Here it is. This is what I'm talking about. These are the structural columns here that are poured-in-place reinforced concrete sheathed in, <laughs> sheathed in polished, um, broken, sheathed in polished Missouri marble. So the, the material allows the chapel's interior to be striking and column free. We know intuitively that the centers of a structural span require less material than the ends. And so here, that cleverly results in an elegant, subtle Gothic arch in the very center of the composition. And here it is in plan. Overall, the chapel does not have a, th a traditional three-aisle basilica plan because this is not a parish church. The stalls, which are drawn in the original plan, you could see them there in the middle, are unique to a convent chapel in which friars or sisters celebrate the liturgy of the hours, like at Sacred Heart. The sisters face each other across a center aisle with a ledge for texts on the altar side of each stall. And this arrangement faces two directions, encouraging interaction and engagement as opposed to the traditional arrangement of pews that face straight ahead towards the altar. Sacred Heart has a section for the laity closest to the narthex and the public entrance that is arranged with pews in the traditional three-aisle basilica plan. So that, that three-aisle basilica plan is the term for the prototypical arrangement of a church interior that goes back to when Christians first started building churches. And that three-aisle basilica, when you see it in plan, you know that that's what it's referencing. I mentioned this kind of plan when I showed Mies van der Rohe's heating plant at IIT, a center aisle with two symmetrically flanking and often similar aisles, potently evoke a church or a church-like use, regardless of the building's actual use. The architects did give, a, uh, give us that traditional plan in Rosary Chapel, oriented in the traditional east-west manner, focusing on the main altar. Its seating is a cross between stalls and pews. Now, the lights weren't on when we were up there, but that's what it looks like. Its um, seating, as I said, is a cross between stalls and pews. They're wood, they have sides, but they all face forward. The side aisles have niches for the stations of the cross, and they're separated from, there's the stations of, of the cross. They're separated from the center aisle by these wonderfully elegant attenuated Gothic arches. Let's see. Okay, so I have never seen before a cross-axial arrangement of two worship spaces. Churches frequently have side chapels and small devotional altars, but two cross-axial naves sharing the same altar is quite unusual. Focused on a mosaic of the Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, Rosary Chapel, you can see it there on the side of the on the side of the church nearest the altar. Yeah. So this is the view from the Rosary Chapel. The altar is right there, and then that 
that's the mosaic I'm speaking of. Rosary Chapel mediates between tradition in its east-west orientation and three-aisle basilica design and modernism. And that mediation continues, I think, in Sacred Heart's second collection of artworks, those by the De Prado Regali Studios in Chicago. The chapel's three works by Regali, the altar, the transept mosaics, and the Stations of the Cross, are not based in modernism. They possess a slight abstraction which can be traced more to post-war revival of Byzantine architectural conventions than to modernism. And therein lies its own dissertation that I'm not going to get into. Lucky for you. They are quite traditional in concept and in execution. The juxtaposition of such stark modernism in architecture and stained glass and such a re-presentation re of tradition in Rosary Chapel's plan and mosaics and in the Stations of the Cross is striking, I think. The Dominicans had for decades previous been the ones who most embraced modernist expressions in sacred art and architecture. This complex was commissioned in 1962 and subsequently designed with the knowledge and expectation of what Vatican II would finally confirm in 1965. So why doesn't Sacred Heart more consistently embrace a progressive contemporary expression of sacred art and architecture? Well, about this very issue, Sister Mary Linda Tonelato said, uh, that to, who it was a sister who was here and uh, had a wonderful conversation with the last time I presented this. She said that to her, the chapel's mosaics and the stations were reminders of where the church had come from. And the windows and the architecture were evidence of where the church was going. It wasn't a hope of where it was going. It was proof that it was there and continuing to get there. And I thought that was brilliant. I wish I thought of it myself. <laughs> that push and pull between the traditional and the modern we talked about at length earlier, the testing by Father Couturier, the rebuttals by Pope Pius XII, the validation of Vatican II, all of that plays itself out here in Sacred Heart, whose design was finalized in the same year Vatican II came to a close. The abstract doll de Vere windows enframe the altar's figural mosaics. The three-aisled basilica shares the same altar as the open, inclusive, un unobstructed chapel volume. The modernist architectural vocabulary sl subtly, slyly hints at traditional Gothic. The dialogue, introspection, mediation that the very stalls in the nave are meant to generate occurs all around us in the art as it mediates between tradition and innovation, and in ourselves as we become the bridge between past and future. And with this mantle of inclusiveness, we may find solace and comfort and relevance and resonance. So thank you very much. going to help put our building in context, and I think he did that beautifully in ways that I'm going to be thinking about for a while. Oh, good. So, I'm so, glad to so hear thank that. you very much. Um, we just have a few minutes. Does anyone have questions? Can't imagine. <laughs> uh, that was pretty complete. Yes, sir. How difficult So the, it, it is, it's a very labor-intensive process. You'd think that, that it would be somehow easier than leaded glass, but it's, I don't think it is, because you have to make sure to have the reinforcing rods in place. You have to make sure that the glass is affixed to a substrate enough so that when you pour the concrete in, it doesn't move around. But then also, you have to get it out of there. You have to flip it over. You have to clean the concrete off of one surface before it cures. You have to get it off the glass where it shouldn't be. It's a giant production, and these windows are enormous things. They're narrow, but they're incredibly tall. So the weight of just the glass, let alone the steel and the concrete, is immense. And then the, the, the way that you have to treat the glass to prepare it and then treat the windows once it's cast, it's just all about technique. 
designing the windows almost in some respects might be the easier way to go. But Loire had a, a huge studio with lots of people assisting. He would design the windows and the fabrication of them, even to a certain extent the creation of the cartoons, which is the full version, scale version of the drawing, would be handled by others in his studio. It was an enormous team effort. It was not easy. Connie. Hey, did they come from France? How did they get here? And then how were they packed? I guess in boxes, but yes, I mean, they would. I just, I just, I just I mean, said transportation alone. They came on a ship through the um, St. Lawrence Seaway and down the Mississippi River to Peoria and then by truck. In the back. I think you're absolutely right. And sometimes the artists doing the illuminations had more of a sense of humor than those doing the text, and so we get little bonuses as a result of their intervention. I think it was a little more controlled in Loire's <laughs> studio. Uh, but I think, I think you're right. There is that kind of handoff that, that exists here. Um, but the, one of the points that I had wanted to make, and thank you for bringing that up, is because they were both speaking this language of modernism. They both were coming from, one from an architectural modernist discussion of what church is, what tradition is, and one from an artistic modernist discussion of what religion is, what is what representation is. They managed to come together despite, one from Springfield, one from France, coming together to produce a very cohesive overall work of art, well, interior, experiential interior. And that also is really impressive to me. There was that cohesion despite there being no collaboration, no direct collaboration. You know, here's, this is an interfaith group, and we're at a, a liturgical arts festival event. So I want to say this. The three main architects, Ken Parker, uh, Aidan Lochner, and Bill Maslowski, were all members of the Baha'i community here in Springfield. <laughs> and I, we are in um, constant and um, uh, very warm relationship with the Baha'i community, and I, I just find that to be a marvelous um, reality for us. That's right, that the relationship with Hadley and Worthington that the diocese had over the years can't be overstated in how it can result in additional commissions. We see that all over the country. In Chicago, the firm of Belly and Belly was commissioned by the diocese there over and over again for schools and churches. We see the same thing in Philadelphia and other places where if you had that, if the firm had that relationship with the diocese, it just got the commissions. So, and yes, exactly, it could be very traditional. But then in 1959, 60, you know, if you wanted a big giant commission and you wanted it to be traditional, 
you probably would have had to argue with the architects to get a traditional commission. Um, one of the cathedrals that I had shown in La Crosse, Wisconsin, that was exactly contemporary with that modern church in Colfax, I don't know if you noticed the difference in age between the two architects who designed one of them, but the traditional Gothic church from 1958 was at the end of his career, and the very modern church from the same year was in the relative beginning of the other architect's career. So stressing why I said, you know, Hadley and Worthington were too old to have designed this, it, it's true. It's very rare to see at that time someone who was educated in the 19-teens and 20s transition into a modern vocabulary like this without seeing evidence of that very traditional Beaux-Arts training coming out. So the firm got it. Are you saying that you, you danced that dance, perhaps, but Paul? Still, when you have uh, the young people that came in, they followed their direction. I mean, they were smart enough to know, I mean, as Harry and Worthington, mm -hmm. they were smart enough architects, I mean, to recognize the working of the younger architects and how they could bring to the table what was required in this case. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they did. And they did. And showing those examples of things that were very contemporary, those the the building by the Architects Collaborative that I showed that was, you know, 1959 to 62, this stuff was published very quickly. And everybody subscribed to the architecture journals. And I know when I was in college, you read those things and you looked at the pictures and you wished you thought of it. And so to have it be reflecting in a commission so quickly, and you can trace that element, you know, the paired windows around a column, you could trace it through commissions across the country. It is amazing how well you can do that and say, well, that's the young guys looking. The old guys don't give a crap. They're not looking at that stuff. They're, they're making sure payroll is met. They're, you know, they're schmoozing and going to the receptions and getting the commissions. And then the, I mean, that's often how it is in a firm of, and that was a large firm for Springfield, 14 people in the um, early to mid-1960s. So just how a firm functions, it's got to be sort of, you know, the younger people would do it in the firm, and younger could still be in their 30s or 40s, because you know, when you're 57, you're a young architect. I don't know how that is. And other projects yeah, the other projects that were contemporary designs, like the insurance building I showed in downtown, that we know Lochner designed, so you could trace his influence through the, 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 the commissions of Hadley and Worthington. How, however, Sister Ida Marie, decided that this was the way our chapel was going to look, aren't we glad she did? <laughs> and uh, so I want to say thank you to all of you for coming. We could stay here all night, I think, but we better not do that. Thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest. I hope you can enjoy some other liturgical arts festival events this week, too. Thank you. Thank you.